BioWare is a name legendary and infamous, the driving force behind several of gaming's all-time best-selling franchises and most devastating disappointments. Yet long before it created Mass Effect or Dragon Age, BioWare was a tiny scrappy company formed by people who knew next to nothing about game design. The studio came out of nowhere to release Baldur's Gate, a game often credited with saving the market for western computer role-playing games on its release in 1998. So how was it made, and why was it so successful? Hi, I'm Matt, and this is Computer Gaming Yesterday, where I dive deep into the history of computer gaming. Today, I'm gonna to give you the full history of Baldur's Gate. It's a story of incredible consequence. Even today, many computer games emulate its ideas, particularly in narrative and character design. But this story has humble beginnings in Edmonton, Alberta, where six friends with no experience came together to form one of the world's most influential game studios. Let's get into it. The Edmonton, Alberta of 1995, the year Bioware was founded, was far from an obvious place to found a video game studio. The city was in a bit of a lull, recovering from the collapse of oil prices a decade prior. Tech companies of any breed, they just weren't a thing in Edmonton. Yet this is where the original group of six came together. Six is a lot of founders, so I think it's easiest to place them in two groups. I'll call them the devs and the doctors. The devs were two brothers, Trent and Brent Oster, and their friend Marcel Zeschuk. In 1994, they decided to make a game, although they, like so many hopeful young game devs, had no prior experience in professional game development and didn't know anyone who could provide advice or guidance. Still, they decided to give it a shot. They started the game that would become Blasteroids 3D in the summer of 1994, dedicating every night to the project. By fall, they'd finished the game and released it for MS-DOS as shareware. It was... well, it was a disaster. Trent Oster, speaking to Matt Barton for his interview series Matt Chat, said, quote, We shipped it out shareware, and we made absolutely zero dollars from it. Still, it was a game, and it worked, so the trio considered it a success. They'd proven to themselves they could make a game. Now they just needed to figure out how to sell one. At the same time, Ray Muzika and Greg Zeschuk, the pair today often referred to as just the doctors, were discussing their own ambitions. They met while attending med school at the University of Alberta. The pair was, in fact, a trio at the time. Augustine Yip, also a med student at the University of Alberta, was fast friends with Muzika and Zeschuk. Their friendship was partly rooted in their shared love for gaming. All three graduated and became practicing medical doctors, but their curiosity for computers led them to work on educational medical software, including two projects called Acid Base Simulator and, after that, Gastroenterology Patient Simulator. Now, that might sound like a meme game you'd find on Steam today, but uh, it was a real piece of software that combined medical education with an interface inspired by contemporary adventure games, and the doctors sold it to a pharmaceutical company. Acid-based simulator, meanwhile, was used by students at the University of Alberta. Now, you might have noticed that Marcel and Greg share a last name, Zeschuk. Marcel is Greg's cousin. Greg Zeschuk would sometimes visit the devs as they worked on Blasteroids 3D through 1994, and the shared interests of the two groups began to come together. The six started to talk about founding the company. They pitched a few names back and forth. BioWare Ascendant was an early frontrunner, but it was considered a little bit too long, so they shortened to the BioWare just before the company was founded in February of 1995. Today, of these six, only the doctors are remembered as the company's founders, and that's for two reasons. One is the financial realities of founding a company. While all six were present, Ray Muzika, Greg Zeschuk, and Augustine Yip funded the company. They plunged their income from medical work into the studio, then maxed out their credit cards. Their total investment crept into the low six figures. But aside from that, the beginning of Bioware was a bit messy, a symptom of initial conflicts of personality. Two of the six individuals I've mentioned so far would exit within a year of the company's founding. It began with complaints from Brent Oster about Marcel Zeschuk's work ethic, which led to some tense early days at the company. The founders were forced by Brent to choose between him and Marcel, and Brent won. Marcel was pushed out of the company. Meanwhile, Bioware started its first project, the mech combat game Shattered Steel, although it was originally called Mech Hive. 
and that game was based on the bones of the Blasteroids 3D engine. However, soon it was Brent Oster and Augustine Yip who couldn't see eye to eye. This time, Brent's complaints held a lot less sway because Yip was well liked in the group and he was closely connected to Ray and Greg who, along with Yip, were responsible for the company's funding. The Osters decided it would probably be best to break away from Bioware and develop Shattered Steel on their own, so they did that and they formed a new company called Pyrotech Games. But after several months, even Trent and Brent were finding it difficult to work together, so following a heated argument, they decided to split. Brent left to work on military simulation games such as the Jane's franchise for Origin Systems. Trent, meanwhile, he closed the newly formed studio and decided to return to Bioware, bringing Shattered Steel back to the company in 1996. While Trent Oster was there when Bioware began, his departure to form Pyrotech left only the doctors in charge of the company's overall direction, with Trent taking point on the development of Shattered Steel now that he had returned. Like I said, it was a bit of a messy start. But still, Trent's reunion with Bioware gave the studio a game that was well on its way to completion. The young company struck a publishing agreement with Interplay and the game was released to mixed reviews in October of 1996. However, as you might imagine, the Doctors weren't just sitting idle while the Osters were away. They began to toss around ideas and prototypes for what they imagined, until the reunion with Shattered Steel, might become Bioware's first game. It was called Battleground Infinity, and it was going to be an MMO. Work on the game that would become Baldur's Gate began to pick up steam through early 1996 as the young Bioware began to expand. Although still confined to a small office, the team infamously had to boot up computers one by one in a specific sequence in order to avoid tripping a circuit breaker, the Doctors had big ambitions. They almost immediately doubled the size of Bioware by hiring six enthusiastic young students from Grand Prairie who moved to Edmonton, Alberta together. This group included James Olin, who'd become the lead designer of Baldur's Gate. Another early hire was Scott Grieg, a programmer who, like everyone else at the company, had no previous experience with games. He was quickly put to work building a game engine and demo for what Bioware thought might be an MMO, though to be precise, the term MMO was not yet coined. Baldur's Gate was uh, originally another concept we called Battleground Infinity. It was going to be this pantheon of all the mythologies, all the different gods. It was going to be an MMO. It was kind of crazy ambitious. Players would enter the game as low-level characters with the goal of gaining power and eventually entering the pantheon of the gods. It was planned to mash up mythological themes from across the globe. Augustine Yip, speaking of the game in the mind, said the game was to include Norse, Roman, Aztec, and Chinese mythology, among others. That was the idea, at least. Bioware's Battleground Infinity game demo was definitely a bit rough. It didn't just lack the features of a modern MMO, it lacked any features at all. It was little more than a game engine that let a 2D character move across a 2D background and click on enemies to kill them. Even so, the Doctors did not waste any time and they began to shop the game idea around with publishers. The demo soon found its way in front of Fergus Urquhart. Today, Urquhart is the CEO of Obsidian Entertainment, the studio behind beloved RPGs like Outer Worlds, Pillars of Eternity, and Fallout New Vegas, among many others. Back then, Urquhart was leading a division of Interplay that would become known as Black Isle Studios, though that name was not yet settled in 1996 and he was responsible for leading the publisher's efforts in role-playing games. An important part of that job was making full use of Interplay's licensing rights for Dungeons & Dragons, and Bioware's tech demo seemed to be a potential fit. Urquhart gave the small and experienced company an opportunity. Interplay would publish Bioware's RPG if it was a more traditional role-playing game based in D&D's Forgotten Realms universe. This was an offer that Bioware couldn't and wouldn't refuse. Most employees at the studio had played D&D and many were huge fans. Better still, Bioware's D&D role-playing game was positioned to be the first to hit store shelves since the collapse of Strategic Simulations Incorporated, the former D&D license holder, which had published the long-running and beloved line of gold box D&D role-playing games for MS-DOS. Although delays of Baldur's Gate would eventually push its release date past that of Descent to Undermountain, a D&D role-playing game developed and published by Interplay. The ink was dry on the deal by mid-1996, giving a jolt in the arm to Bioware's enthusiastic and green crew. Now all the team had to do was build a game worthy of the Dungeons & Dragons franchise, and that experience would be a first for almost everyone involved with the project.
The Battleground Infinity demo would become the core of the Infinity engine that defined the Baldur's Gate franchise and its cousins like Planescape Torment and Icewind Dale. Its key innovation was the use of the DirectX DirectDraw API to import a custom full screen background from Photoshop. Scott Grieg, who handled programming on the demo, at first thought to design the game's engine on 2D tile-based art, a time-honored tradition still used by some modern 2D games. Tile-based art was the gold standard in the early 1990s because it was efficient. An entire dungeon might be made of just a few dozen repeating tiles laid across the 2D grid. But Grieg and the rest of the team, they had no experience designing and working with tile-based 2D art, and they soon found out it was a lot more difficult than it seemed. Tile-based art is a specific skill set. An artist that knows how to handle it can make individual tiles almost invisible, but an inexperienced artist can end up with a blocking, repetitive mess. Bioware's efforts definitely skewed towards the latter. So, Grieg proposed that the new DirectDraw API included in Microsoft's DirectX 3 could be the solution. What if, instead of using tiles, the game engine could import in a single piece of art drawn at high resolution with support for 16-bit or 32-bit color? This approach completely sidestepped the tile problem by letting artists design a 2D level as one single, cohesive, seamless work. The only problem? Well, it would take up a lot more storage. Baldur's Gate would end up shipping on 5 CDs at launch. Still, the team decided the gamers would have no problem hassling with extra CDs once they saw the game's high quality art. And it truly was a quantum leap forward in 2D graphics. The MS-DOS era of PC gaming was defined by 8-bit color and memory limitations that made it difficult to serve up visuals with additional color depth or high pixel counts. Large complex game worlds were essentially impossible even with 2D graphics as computers would quickly run out of memory. That forced role-playing games from the early 1990s into constrained, narrow perspectives. Larger scenes could only be shown through static art during important moments in the game's story or, later in the 1990s, through FMV movies. The Infinity Engine turned the high-resolution custom art normally reserved for special occasions into the backbone of the game. It had the most detailed, the most unique visuals in any 2D role-playing game yet. At release, Baldur's Gate alone, not including the expansion or any additional content added by the newer Enhanced Edition, contained over 10,000 screens of custom 2D art, all of it entirely unique aside from the occasional reuse of art for roads or vegetation. Baldur's Gate and later games based on the Infinity Engine use an isometric perspective. This technique was made popular by early strategy games like Populous, and then embraced by role-playing with the release of Blizzard's Diablo. Tilting the perspective at an approximately 45 degree angle let artists provide a sense of three-dimensional depth without real 3D graphics. Indeed, games of this era often designed art using three-dimensional models, which were captured as 2D sprites from multiple angles. This, however, led the team headfirst into a new problem. It turned out that a normally proportioned 3D model didn't look quite right when captured for use in a 2D isometric game. To compensate for this, the artists designed models with wild proportions. Trent Oster and Cameron Topher, lead programmer on Baldur's Gate, told Hollywood Reporter that most characters had 4 foot long legs and tiny 2 foot long torsos. It looked ridiculous when viewed head on, and constant mucking with character proportions easily consumed the time the team saved by skipping a tile-based 2D art approach. Outstanding art, however, is only half of what the Infinity Engine would become known for. The other half is the interface, largely reliant on mouse input with the exception of the spacebar, which, don't worry, we'll get to in a moment. The game's interface and controls were heavily influenced by the real-time strategy genre. It may seem strange for a role-playing game, but in the mid-1990s, this was perfectly natural. The real-time strategy genre, made popular by games like Command & Conquer and Warcraft, was grabbing headlines across PC game magazines. The cover story of Computer Gaming World's November 1997 issue highlighted 40 new entries into the surging genre, and even that was not comprehensive. Chris Parker, a producer for Black Isle Studios who worked on Baldur's Gate, told Games Radar that, quote, The RTS genre was proving what you could do strategically in a real-time environment. It seemed like a natural idea to marry the real-time strategy of RTS games with the depth and party-based play of past-gen RPGs. It does seem like there was some disagreement, however, in terms of how far down the RTS rabbit hole Baldur's Gate should go. Augustine Yip, who worked on the interface for Baldur's Gate, told Gaming the Mind that, quote, 
The producer, the publisher, they were called Interplay. They wanted a Warcraft 2-like interface and we had to explain, sort of vehemently, that this is not that type of game. This is a role-playing game, and it is Dungeons and Dragons. Yip wanted to make sure the game remained true to its role-playing roots, even while it embraced real-time strategy ideas. That meant a focus on individual characters and an interface that highlighted the differences between them. To do that, Baldur's Gate gave each character unique, fully voiced responses to player input, another idea taken from the real-time strategy genre and Warcraft in particular. A den of stinking evil. Cover your nose, boo. We will leave no crevice untouched. <laughs> The interface also includes large, high-quality character portraits, which definitely suggests the importance of each individual character and makes it a lot easier to tell between them than it is to tell between units in a real-time strategy game. Now, the task of balancing the ideas from different genres was laid at the feet of James Olin, who became the game's lead designer as development moved through 1996. Olin, who, as you might remember, was one of Bioware's first hires, quickly became a senior employee, and he ended up having to delegate many elements of the studio's ever-growing game to newer employees. As it turned out, mashing RTS concepts with a single-player role-playing game had a lot of perks. It worked perfectly with Baldur Gate's 2D isometric viewpoint, and it made controlling the entire party simple. It also delivered a unique combat experience that took a hard turn away from the turn-based systems that were more popular in earlier RPGs. However, Olin and the rest of the team quickly realized the idea had a really serious flaw. The pace was completely unmanageable. A character in a role-playing game, unlike a unit in a real-time strategy game, can choose from dozens of actions at any moment. Trent Oster, speaking to The Ringer, said that, quote, It became pretty obvious pretty quick that there was no way you were going to be able to play the depths of D&D in real time without ever pausing the game. So, pause it they did. While the Infinity Engine normally executes actions in real time at a fixed pace, players can press the space bar or click a pause button to stop time completely while retaining the ability to issue commands. It's not clear who on the team first suggested this approach, but it's worth remembering that Fallout, released in 1997, did it first with VATS. Fallout was developed by Bioware's publisher, Interplay, and Fallout's director was the same Fergus Orkhart who, as mentioned earlier, headed Black Isle Studios, the Interplay sublabel under which Baldur's Gate would be published. So, I think it's pretty clear where Bioware might have gotten the idea. It's odd to be sure that Baldur's Gate, which faithfully reproduces a turn-based tabletop game, uses a real-time engine, and it does lead to some quirks. D&D is built around an economy of action that limits how much any character can accomplish in a turn. Baldur's Gate replicates that economy of action, though it's not identical to the rules of D&D 2.5, by dividing time into six-second rounds. Most actions can only occur once per round, so characters seem to ignore some commands if they've already taken an action, although, in an important change from tabletop D&D, characters can move at any time, no matter if they've acted in a round or not. Using the action system found in Dungeons & Dragons can feel a little awkward when a character seems to ignore the player, but it does have its perks. Tabletop D&D can become a little dull when a character has to repeat successive actions. Let's say a fighter misses an on an attack. Well, in the next round, they'll have to declare that attack and roll the dice again, and again and again until they hit. And that really, it's not a lot of fun. The real-time pace of Baldur's Gate better obscures that problem, and because the characters have AI, they can repeat actions on their own. In the end, the changes and compromises made in Baldur's Gate successfully retain the flavor of Dungeons & Dragons while obscuring many of its faults. Pausing real-time action was a kludge, added the rein in an out-of-control combat system, but it was successful, so much so that fans of the series had a minor meltdown when Larian Productions announced Baldur's Gate 3 would use turn-based combat instead, despite turn-based combat arguably being a more pure or true interpretation of D&D's ruleset. While many of the unique decisions made during the Infinity Engine's creation were a success, it did go sideways in at least one respect, though most gamers have long forgotten it. As said earlier, the original prototype for the engine was meant for an MMO or something like it rather than a single player game, and in fact, Bioware, and the Doctors in particular, never gave up hope of making multiplayer a big deal. Baldur's Gate was marketed as a computerized multiplayer D&D campaign in a box, playable by up to six players online or over a local network. A preview in the September 1998 issue of Computer Gaming World spent as much time talking about multiplayer as it did single player. 
Ray Muzika, speaking with GameInterviews.com prior to the release of Baldur's Gate, described the multiplayer by saying, quote, Basically, we're trying to recreate the feeling of an old pen and paper RPG of the past with the multiplayer game. He went on to add that, quote, because Baldur's Gate is much more of a long-term endeavor than a lot of other multiplayer games, most groups will probably start to play together and continue to play as they adventure through the game. But as with the engine's art in real-time combat, Bioware bumped into some unexpected gameplay issues with the multiplayer. The most basic was deciding what to do when one character entered a conversation, as the game engine didn't allow multiple characters to talk, debate, argue, or negotiate at once, and it included no rules for scenarios that are common in tabletop D&D, such as opposed diplomacy or deception checks. The solution was to pause the game for all players when a conversation progressed, but this was of course pretty boring for everyone else. It often led to conflict when players disagreed about the best course of action. Many would-be parties broke up before leaving Candlekeep because they couldn't agree on whether to be sincere or a total jerk face when speaking the, the first major NPC you meet. Fortunately, players spending dozens of hours immersed in the single-player mode of Baldur's Gate were happy to ignore multiplayer's flaws. Indeed, the single-player mode would come to dominate so thoroughly that many players seemed to forget the multiplayer even exists within a few months of the game's release. That is a great credit to the game's epic narrative, which, as you might expect, has a long, winding story of its own. Hey, I hope you're enjoying this video about the history of Baldur's Gate so far. If you've gotten to this point, please consider giving the video a like or subscribing to this channel. That'll let you know when the next video game history documentary comes out and it'll really be a big help for me. Now, if you wanna take things to the next level, consider subscribing to my Patreon. You'll find a link to that in the description of this video and the YouTube channel description. You can get exclusive weekly updates on the progress of my next videos, as well as other goodies and insight information. So definitely go check that out. Now with that, let's get back to the video. Story would become essential to the success of not only Baldur's Gate, but also Bioware, a company that rose to stardom on the strength of intricate narratives filled with compelling characters and quests. But as with the rest of the game, the team went into the project with absolutely zero professional writing experience and no clear plan for how to achieve its goal. The bulk of the game's writing, which totals over 800,000 words, was the work of Luke Christiansen, who'd graduated college with an English degree, but had yet to snag a professional writing gig. He came to the company in October of 1996 after getting an interview through a friend of a friend who happened to know the company was hiring. Christiansen's lack of experience was compensated with passion, which he showed by writing a 40-page module for the superhero tabletop role-playing game Champions and submitting it with his application to Bioware. Perhaps before he even knew what he'd gotten himself into, he found himself in charge of steering the narrative of the game many would come to call the savior of Western RPGs. Baldur's Gate wasn't an entirely blank slate when he came on board, however. James Olin had already laid out a rough sketch of the plot and characters, most of which was based on characters Bioware employees had played in previous D&D sessions. Minsk, a ranger with a hamster and a tenuous grip on reality, was based on a character played by Cameron Topher, a programmer on Baldur's Gate. As the story goes, Topher's character was a few levels behind the party and often went down in combat, so he played the hamster, Boo, when Minsk hit the floor. Even villains like Sarvok, the antagonist of Baldur's Gate, were loosely based on characters from past campaigns. Still, the outlines that were given to Christensen by Olin were pretty rough. In an interview with the Ringer, Christensen recalled that Olin's character brief for Minsk, the beloved barbarian, which is arguably the game's most iconic sidekick, was actually little more than, quote, this guy has a head wound and a hamster. It was up to Christensen to turn those quick character details based on memories of past tabletop campaigns into recruitable NPCs that each had thousands of words of dialogue. Other elements of the game's story took shape throughout 1996, and in particular after the team learned it would be making a game set in the Forgotten Realms universe. The game was first called Iron Throne after the shadowy merchant organization key to the game's plot, at least according to a preview snippet in issue 153 of Computer Gaming World. The decision to set the game in Baldur's Gate doesn't seem strange at all in hindsight since the game was massively popular, and today some D&D 5th edition modules are set in the city. 
but in 1996 it was representative of a problem that put Chris Jensen to the test. TSR was not eager to let Bioware use the company's most well-known properties. You see, TSR was facing major financial difficulties at the time. It would be sold to Wizards of the Coast by the end of 1997, and it was worried about handing the likes of, say, Dritz or Wolfgar over to a computer RPG. It thought that maybe it would at best create competition for its own properties and at worst spoil fan-favorite characters. Though TSR would let the famous wizard Elminster make a few brief appearances in Baldur's Gate. Similarly, TSR was not ever eager to let Bioware's game waltz through its most famous cities and locales. That left the team to consider some lesser known possibilities. Although included in the Forgotten Realms campaign setting for a D&D 2nd edition, Baldur's Gate and its surrounding areas, including the Sword Coast and Candlekeep, were not a big part of the Forgotten Realms universe at the time, as there were no Forgotten Realms novels or published D&D adventures set in the city. In other words, Baldur's Gate was a bit of a backwater. It was unfamiliar even to many fans of D&D and virtually unknown to anyone who didn't play the game. Bioware could have viewed this as a disadvantage, as Baldur's Gate certainly didn't hold the weight of better known locales like Icewind Dale. Indeed, it's easy to imagine how there could have been some bad feelings about this. After all, Bioware got to license the Dungeons & Dragons from DSR, but that apparently didn't include the use of any of the most popular and well-known locales or characters that go along with that license. But the Bioware team decided to roll with it and viewed it as an advantage. Because they wouldn't be tied down to those pre-existing known locales and characters, they could roll their own. They didn't have to worry about whether or not the ideas they wanted to come up with would agree with existing Forgotten Realms lore. Setting wasn't the only way TSR limited Bioware's use of the license. The company also asked the studio to respect its code of ethics, which included requirements such as, quote, Evil shall never be portrayed in an attractive light and will be used only as a foe to illustrate a moral issue. Such a code might sound preposterous today and TSR did in practice allow a bit of wiggle room, but at its core, TSR's code of ethics was extremely serious. It was created in the early 1980s as a response to the Satanic Panic, a moral panic that convinced many people that Satanic cults were operating inside the United States. Dungeons and Dragons was frequently accused of being a front for Satanic cults, indoctrinating children with realistic fantasy role-playing that would lead them to accept the magical pacts with Satan. This code of ethics, along with changes to the art direction of TSR products, was meant to show parents that the company's game posed no threat to their children. Let's stop this heinous crime that's going on in the name of the devil. The satanic panic had died down quite a bit by the 1990s, but it wasn't gone, a fact I can personally attest to as the parents of some of my childhood friends sincerely believed all fantasy stories and games were the devil's work. TSR's code of ethics was still in effect, and any company that wanted to use its properties had to abide by it. Chris Parker told GamesRadar that, quote, TSR's code of ethics was somewhat limiting and forced us to often boil everything evil down into simply being greedy. If you ever wondered why playing an evil character is unrewarding and difficult in Baldur's Gate, or why some conversations often lead to good outcomes even when the player character is a bit of a jerk, you can blame TSR's code of ethics. TSR was initially under the impression that Bioware's RPG would be the equivalent of an introductory module spanning five or six levels and taking place around a single, small town. Instead, Bioware shot back ideas for massive campaigns that were, in fact, far grander in scope than what Baldur's Gate would become, taking characters from first levels of level 20 and beyond. Truth be told, no one on the Bioware team, not the Doctors, not Olin, and not Chris Jensen, had a firm grasp on the scope of the tale they wanted to tell, and this much is evident in early previews and interviews. At times, it seems the team floated the possibility of building an entire level 1-20 to campaign into a single game. That idea was apparently dropped by 1997, however, as previews of the game instead pitched Baldur's Gate as the base for multiple future expansion packs that would expand on the base game's campaign. Baldur's Gate would indeed get one expansion pack, Tales of the Sword Coast, but the additional planned story was spun off into the sequel, Baldur's Gate 2 Shadows of Om. The team's huge ambition and lack of experience meant the game's story changed significantly throughout the game's creation. It seems most of the writing was handled without effective tools to organize it. Player dialogue choices, for example, weren't tracked with fancy project management software, but instead by using bullet points in a Word document. This led to a fair bit of confusion and revision as the project progressed. Emwyn is an example of this. Known today as one of the most important non-player characters in the entire franchise, Christensen added her late in development to, quote, fill a non-psychotic thief gap in the early levels. 
Her voice lines were salvaged from dialogue recorded for a guard, and that meant she didn't have the same level of interaction with other characters as most NPCs. The game's writing is also rather inconsistent. Baldur's Gate is in some ways an epic series role-playing game, the computerized equivalent of a thousand-page fantasy novel, yet it's also rooted in the often absurd and silly experiences of Chris Jensen, Olin, and the Doctors had while tabletop gaming. Baldur's Gate is a game that will have you save villagers from an extremely grisly death one moment, and then pest you with an annoying NPC named Nuber minutes later. Better planning might have avoided this problem, but Baldur's Gate wasn't built around a carefully constructed narrative or even a set in stone design document. It was created by a team that was learning on the fly, driven by sheer ambition. As with the Infinity Engine, an experience did lead the team to consider ideas that might have otherwise been dismissed. The game's reliance on a narrative told primarily through text rather than CGI movies, which, it should be noted, were extremely trendy at the time, gave Bioware the opportunity to have a more expansive and deeper narrative than it could have managed if it was trying to mimic Hollywood production values. And the experience the Bioware team had around tabletop gaming taught them that character interactions were crucial, which led to the large cast of NPCs. Just imagine, with all of its side quests and all of its many characters, Bioware put in a lot of content that many players, even those who'd completely finished the game, would never see. A lot of more experienced developers might have considered that inefficient, but Bioware, well, they just didn't know any better. It wasn't all sunshine and rainbows, though. The sheer size of the game forced Bioware to expand rapidly, hitting 60 developers at launch. Despite that, there was always more work to go around, leading to a long, grueling march towards launch. Of That's right. This is great news here for pizza lovers. A health nutrition editor is offering up a healthier alternative, and that is pizza. Fantastic. Most cereals are packed with sugar. You know that. But nutritionist Chelsea Amer says a slice contains more fat and much less sugar. than most It's a good thing that pizza is great for breakfast, because that is exactly what greeted Bioware developers as they filtered in any given morning in 1997, if in fact they'd ever left the office at all. Those who'd stayed overnight could use the on-site shower, though most developers didn't, and apparently it eventually became a storage closet. Among those dragging in would be Greg Zestchuk, who continued to work the night shift at Edmonton's Glen Rose Rehabilitation Hospital, and usually stumbled in after just a few hours of rest. Ray Muzika, meanwhile, still worked weekend shifts as an emergency room doctor and would fill in when necessary. Both practiced medicine regularly during the entire development of Baldur's Gate, which was a necessity because their self-funded approach to development didn't include a salary for the company's CEOs. The doctors didn't leave medicine until 1999, after Baldur's Gate proved that Bioware had a future in the video game industry. It was a hectic, grueling environment that often forced seven-day work weeks of dawn-till-dusk development, particularly towards the end of Baldur's Gate. It was this pace that led Augustine Yip, the third doctor and founder of Bioware, to back out of the company. Yip said, quote, We were just exhausted. Game development was 18-hour days, no exercise, poor nutrition, literally pizzas and coke for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yip left the company to return to medicine full-time in 1998. These war stories are often told as a point of pride, though in light of the stories of crunch of Bioware more recently, they take on a darker tone. The entire team that worked on Baldur's Gate had to work an intense schedule that effectively made life outside work impossible. Still, there's a notable difference between the environment they allowed the creation of Baldur's Gate and Bioware as it exists today. Namely, the employees back then were invested. This was a literal investment in some cases, as interviews with the doctors over the years have said that employees of Bioware had ownership shares in the company. Beyond that, and perhaps most importantly, the team was invested in their own careers. The company's lack of experience at all levels, from the founders on down to the designers, artists, and writers, put everyone in the same boat. If Bioware had failed, it's unlikely most employees would have transitioned to a career in video games. Edmonton was a long, long way from other development studios and publishers. But Bioware didn't fail, of course. The launch of Baldur's Gate was a success not only for the game, but also for the company's broader ambitions, which already included development of MDK2 and hope for additional games that would use the Infinity Engine. Bioware stayed, the doctors finally felt comfortable quitting medicine, and Edmonton became a hub for Canada's video game industry. This makes it more difficult to judge the crunch facing the team during the development of Baldur's Gate. On one hand, it sounds like an all-consuming and frankly unhealthy work environment. 
On the other, it was the start of a new career for nearly everyone involved. So did the ends justify the means? Well, I think that's something you'd really have to ask of each individual who was involved in the project. In any case, though, the fact that Severe Crunch occurred during the development of Baldur's Gate is of historical significance. Complaints of excessive and often pointless crunch have surrounded recent Bioware titles like Dragon Age Inquisition, Mass Effect Andromeda, and Anthem. This is often blamed on Electronic Arts, which now owns Bioware, and certainly Electronic Arts is responsible for what happens to its employees. However, I think that it's very clear that Crunch was part of Bioware's company culture from the very beginning. Baldur's Gate stumbled out of the door on December 21st, 1998, and I do think stumbled is not an unfair word. For all its many accomplishments, the inexperienced development team hadn't managed to sand off its rough edges and reviewers took note. PC Accelerator's review of the game complained that, quote, you may find the blue screen of death as often as a cobalt, while Computer Gaming World's review throws flack at the game's pathfinding AI, which at release had a really bad habit of getting stuck on objects or, in other cases, just walking through them completely. A majority of reviewers also complained about the pausable real-time combat, which was seen as a ploy the satisfied turn-based and real-time strategy fans in one game. Despite these problems, Baldur's Gate earned high praise and good scores from reviewers at the time, including those who dinked it for bugs. Computer Gaming World and PC Accelerator, among the least impressed, still gave the game an 8 out of 10. PC Zone and PC Powerplay gave the game an 85% and 87% respectively, while Next Generation Magazine gave it a perfect 5-star score. More than anything, though, reviewers felt Baldur's Gate was more than the sum of its parts. It was buggy, the store wasn't particularly well edited, and its plausible combat could feel like a ham-fisted effort to merge two ideas, and everyone who installed it just could not stop playing. PC Powerplay captured this sentiment in its review, saying Baldur's Gate might disappoint both fans of Ultima 7, who might hope for detail and depth, and fans of Daggerfall, who might prefer sheer scale. The befuddled reviewer asks, quote, so why is Baldur's Gate, if it offers neither of the above, such a bloody great game then? This is a question answered by Next Generation's glowing review, which observed that Baldur's Gate was unique among RPGs for being, quote, one of the first that's deeply replayable. That's the revolution of Baldur's Gate in a nutshell. Earlier role-playing games were often entirely linear, following a set sequence of levels and events. Players could expect to see all party members in all game areas by the time they'd finish the game. Then, new role-playing games like Bethesda's Daggerfall started to challenge that status quo through the 1990s, but they often failed to deliver a compelling story and relied too heavily on repetitive levels in combat. Baldur's Gate found the compromise. It wasn't the largest role-playing game, and it wasn't the deepest, but it was deep enough and large enough that players felt their actions had real consequence in the game's world. It provided a long list of NPCs and different ways for those NPCs to interact with each other, which meant that you couldn't actually see all the different interactions in any one playthrough of the game. Baldur's Gate also includes several substantial side quest storylines that a player can easily just miss if they don't happen to go to the right place or respond properly in a certain conversation. That's something that a more experienced game development studio would probably consider a waste of time. Bioware, however, didn't have experience. They didn't really know any better, so they were perfectly willing to put in content that many players would not see on any given playthrough. It's also worth remembering that the Infinity Engine was a bit of a technical showcase. It was one of the first games to make extensive use of the Direct Draw API. And because the game relied entirely on 2D graphics, it was able to depict a large world without relying on 3D accelerators, which were still pretty niche hardware at the time. Indeed, I think it's very much arguable that the Infinity Engine games were kind of a last hurrah for 2D gaming, as the industry would end up fixating on 3D graphics for the next decade. Now, positive reviews would drive the original Baldur's Gate to sell over 2 million copies, a figure that does not include any of the newer enhanced edition copies available for PC, mobile, and multiple consoles. This immediately established the franchise as one of the best-selling role-playing franchises of all time. And Bioware capitalized on that success. It immediately launched headlong into Baldur's Gate 2, the game that would solidify the franchise's place in gaming history, and even more so than the original, establish a template Bioware games would follow for the next two decades. But I have to draw the line somewhere, don't I? So that'll have to be a story for another video. 
Believe me, if you want it, I'll cover it. So let me know in the comments. Now, as I draw this video to a close, I want to shout out my sources, which are listed in the description of this video below. Over 80 hours of research went into this video, but that would not be possible without original sources to build off of. So definitely check those out.